I grew up on an estate in South London. I won't tell you its name, but it crops up in the news on a regular basis for all of the worst reasons. My father had walked out on me and my mother when I was four years old, and I wouldn't have recognized him if he had been standing in front of me. My mother tried her best, but she was a mess. Drinking was how she got through the day. As I got older, I tried looking after her, I tried hiding the bottles and taking the little money that she had and buying ready meals that I would make for her. But when the alcohol gets its claws dug into you the way that it had my mother, it's not food that you want, it's another drink. One night after she had cut my lip open by drunkenly throwing a plate at me and calling me a lowlife, I walked out of the house and I never went back. I ran wild after this. I became part of a gang because I didn't see any other way to survive on the estate. I did things that I'm ashamed of, and I made it to my 18th birthday with a bunch of scars and a minor reputation, and most importantly of all, without a police record. That meant I could escape. A couple of years before I hit 18, I had seen an advert for the army on the battered old TV in the house where I was staying for a few days. The world it showed it captured my imagination. A world full of adventure and promise and friendship and change. This was a million miles away from the life that I was leading. It was 3am when I saw the advert. I was huddled up on a sofa under a thin, filthy blanket and I knew that there was no way I was going to get any sleep because of the music pounding up from the room next door. My side was burning with pain where I had been cut after a deal had gone wrong and I had to do a runner through dark, lonely streets. The soldiers on the advert were living in what looked like a dream in comparison, and that night I vowed to join the army as soon as I could. On the morning of my 18th birthday, I caught a bus into the city center and found a recruiting office. I think the sergeant behind the desk must have seen a lot of young men like me because he didn't seem bothered that I didn't have any qualifications or know where my birth certificate was. It took a while after this for my application to be processed. I also had to do a medical. All the time, I was constantly thinking that I was going to be rejected, and my only future was going to be on the streets, until the inevitable happened and I ended up in prison. But I got in. I fell to my knees and cried for the first time in a long time when I had found out. I was going to be a soldier and I could say goodbye to the estate. I had nothing to pack and reported to the base where I was going to do my basic training. The first few weeks of this were the hardest of my life. I was exhausted and aching and blistered from the runs and the time in the gym and on drill. I found it hard to sit still in the classroom where we learned about the structure of the army and the rules and responsibilities that we had taken on. The meals that we were served were good but never enough. My body was burning through calories and I felt permanently hungry. I didn't really get to know any of the other new soldiers. As soon as we were all off duty, all any of us wanted to do was crawl into bed and is get as much sleep as we could before being woken up before dawn. So yes, it was hard, but I was also happy. I felt good about myself and I felt like I belonged, for the first time in my life. I know how corny this will sound, but the army was the family that I had never had. One that made me run across to fields in the pouring rain, with a heavy pack on my back, but family all the same. I knew that joining up was the best decision that I could have made. And I could not wait to finish basic training and see what came next. Maybe a posting abroad. Somewhere that there were beaches. Most likely I would stay in the UK, but that was fine. My future was looking bright. Or so I thought. I was dragging myself out of bed one morning, feeling sorry for myself, but with a wiry smile on my face. 
when I noticed the rest of the barracks were empty. Panicking that I had overslept, I checked the time on my alarm clock. It read 5.30. So painfully early, but I was awake and rising when I should be. And puzzled and still half asleep, I padded along the cold floor on my way to the shower room. I didn't make it. From out of nowhere, somebody leapt at me and sent me crashing to the floor. They rolled off, leaving me lying on my back winded. Seconds later, six men ran towards me and began to kick and punch me. I did not recognize any of them, but there was an NCO standing watching the attack. I had seen him before. He had a reputation as a vicious bully and, as I tried to protect myself from the torrents of blows by crouching up as small as I could, I realized that this was a hazing. A sick joke that must have been organized by the NCO. A blow landed on the side of my head, another in my mouth. I felt teeth crack and spat out a line of blood. A boot stamped on my stomach and then one crunched down on my arm. Surely they had to stop soon, I thought. But the beating just seemed to be getting more frenzied. I decided I wasn't going to be taking it anymore, so I grabbed an ankle and pulled. Whoever I had hold of yelped and fell backwards, taking somebody else out. There was a gap in the melee. The grinning face of one of my assailants was suddenly in sight. I didn't stop to think. I hit them as hard as I could. Their eyes rolled back in their head and they toppled over. As suddenly as it had started, the attack had stopped. A gap appeared behind me. Everyone including the NCO was gathering around the man that I had punched. He wasn't moving. The NCO leaned over and felt his pulse, and then he turned and looked at me and said, He's dead. You killed him. I find it hard to describe what happened next, other than to say that nothing felt real. I was being shouted at and dragged to my feet. I was thrown against a wall and held there. It was like it was happening in a dream. When the MPs arrived and handcuffed me and told me that I was under arrest, I still could not believe this was happening. At one point I said, You're making this up right, it's a sick joke. One of the MPs grabbed me by the collar and then pulled me close to his face and growled, You're in deep boy and there's no way out. And then I was locked in a windowless room by myself. The sound of the key turning in the door made me jump. And as it did, everything became crystal clear. There is no doubt anymore. I had killed someone and I was locked up and alone. I curled up on my side and I wept for a long time. Somehow, I must have fallen asleep because I was woken by the sound of something clattering. Quick as flash, I sat upright and saw a tray being pushed through a slot in the bottom of the door. There is a carton of milk on the tray and plate of mashed potatoes and a chocolate bar. Even looking at this it made me want to retch, so I turned away and tried to go back to sleep. A few times I dragged myself up and hammered the door of the cell and shouted that I wanted to see a solicitor. Even though I was in the army, I still had rights. But there was never any response, and I sank back into hopeless despair. Days and nights passed like this. I don't know how many because I had lost track of time. Finally, though, I had a visitor. I was staring at the ceiling when the door had unlocked with a snap and a man had walked in. He wasn't in a uniform, but he looked military to me. His hair was regulation length and he looked lean under his smart and dark suit. His shoes were also polished within an inch of their life. Hope flickered in my chest. Are you here to represent me? I asked. He stood a ramrod straight with his hands clasped behind his back. No, he replied. You don't need legal representation. Your case has already been tried and you have been found guilty. You got life, boy. A cold wave of despair passed through me. You can't do that, I told him. His lip curled in a sneer. We can and we have. 
but I am here to tell you that you still have a choice. You can be a prisoner or a guard. There's a military research facility located off the coast, well away from any shipping lanes. It's not something the army or the politicians who fund it talk about. And as far as Joe Public is concerned, the island that it is on is quarantined because of chemical weapons testing way back in the 1950s. Which is bull, by the way. A cover story. If you agree to be stationed there, you will learn to turn a blind eye and follow orders no matter how wrong they sound. Most people would say no, but most people have hope and family and friends. You have nothing but still, it's a free country. The cynical smile in his face as he said these last words sent rage pulsing through me. But he was right. I was totally alone in the world and desperate. I looked him in the eye and said, Show me where to sign. There was no paperwork, no record of the deal that I was entering into. I was marched out of my cell with an NP on either side, given a clean uniform and a kit bag, and then driven in a jeep to a waiting helicopter. I was shaking as I climbed on board and felt sick as we took off, and the base slipped out of view. We passed over suburban estates and the city sprawls and motorways and then the coast. The sea that was now all I could see was choppy and gray. A while later, a rocky island came into view. A large windowless concrete building was the only sign of life on it. I could see CCTV cameras positioned along its eaves. I began to panic that I was being taken to a prison after all and turned to the crewman sitting next to me. Where are we? I asked. He had spent the journey staring at a tablet computer and did not look up from the screen when he replied. That's your new home. Nightmare Island. I frowned. Why do you call it that? Because it's where all your worst dreams come true. Or so I've heard. I've never set foot in the place myself, and I never will. He smiled grimly and then at that was the end of the conversation. The helicopter landed. The jolt from this almost sent me sprawling onto my backside. And true to his word, the crewmen stayed inside the helicopter and threw out the boxes of supplies that we had been sitting among while I disembarked with my kit bag. And then he slammed the door shut as the helicopter rose back into the sky. I sighed and looked around. There wasn't a single tree, just a few weeds poking up in between gaps in the rocks. It was a better view than the four walls of a prison cell, I told myself. But only just. I was wondering if I should start carrying the supplies towards the building when a roller shutter door in the side of the building had opened. Two soldiers marched out and started to head my way. The welcoming committee, I figured, though they didn't look very welcoming. They were both scowling and heavily armed. As they came closer, I saw that they had no name tags on the uniforms. They didn't have any insignia either, so I had no idea what their rank were. I decided to play it safe and saluted briskly and said, Reporting for duty, sirs. Neither saluted back. One responded by snapping at me. Get those supplies inside now, double quick. The other soldier took out a cigarette and lit up. Neither of them lifted a hand to help me as I ran back and forth, carrying boxes and sacks inside. I was out of shape after my confinement and coated in sweat by the time that I had finished. I wiped my face and glanced around. I seemed to be in some kind of storeroom. There were containers stacked on shelves that rose to the ceiling, and more boxes and sacks piled up across the floor. It was pretty chaotic, to be honest, and not at all like the obsessively well-organized military stores that I had seen before. The two soldiers strolled back into the building. One of them, the smoker, punched a button and the doors rolled shut. Then both of them saluted another soldier who was heading our way. His gray hair was shaved short. He stood right in front of me. 
He stank of stale sweat. His breath as he spoke was worse. I'm your commanding officer. I don't care what your name is. I don't care what you did to end up here and I don't care if you leave on your own two feet or in a body bag. But while you are here, you will do exactly what I say. Do you understand? I nodded. A humorless smile crept across his lips. Good. Now follow me. He strode away towards an elevator. I did as I was ordered and set off after him, and soon found myself descending deep beneath the surface of the island. The elevator doors pinged open and we emerged into a brightly lit passageway. On either side of it, vast glass-fronted rooms stretched out as far as the eye could see. A bustling world of activity was revealed. There were banks of computers, equipment that looked like it belonged in a futuristic hospital for the super-rich, vats and tanks and cylinders, cables and wires and rows of desks, and monitors on walls, across which words and numbers scrolled so quickly that they blurred before my eyes. Men and women in white lab coats moved around the rooms, occasionally stopping to read something or inspect something or press something. I was snapped out of my daze by a sharp shout from the ECO. Shut your mouth, stop staring and move it. I followed him along the passageway until we reached a large metal door. He entered a code and a keypad and the door slid open. Still on his heels, I entered a circular room lined with more monitors. Two soldiers scanned the screens. I saw that the monitor showed the exterior of the building back up on the surface and 360 degree views out to the sea. There were also multiple shots of the rooms that I just passed by. A separate bank of monitors showed a new part of the facility, one which sent a chill down my spine. It was a cell block. The cells were cramped, separated boxes made of some clear material, each occupied by a single person. Instinctively, my hands clamped into fists. By my side, the CO was grinning. I think the sick SOB was actually enjoying my reaction. Those are the lab rats, he said. We've got a dozen staying with us at the moment. I couldn't look at him. I was horrified. What crimes had these poor souls done to be incarcerated like this? And what in the heck did he mean by lab rats? I was desperate to ask, but I suspected that my questions would be responded to with a volley of abuse, so I kept my silence while the CO continued. You will be stationed here in the control room and will monitor the screens. Check the lab rats and make sure they're behaving in that there are no unwelcome visitors approaching the island by sea or air. Hopefully that is simple enough for you to even understand. I was burning inside with hatred but simply said, Yes sir. I had hoped as well that he had been done with me for now but he added, But your first duty is to take the lab rats or their slop. A trolley holding rows of trays had been brought into the control room while I was being lectured. Open up the entrance to the cell block. The CO yelled and a door at the far end of the room slid open. I wheeled the trolley through it and found myself face to face with the prisoners. I refused to dehumanize them further by thinking of them as lab rats. They were young men, no different to me. Young scared men. As slots at the base of each of the cells opened, presumably at the touch of a button in the control room, I slid a tray through. None of the prisoners looked up at me as I did this. They seemed lethargic as if their spirits had been broken, or they had been chemically subdued. I noticed as well that they all had wristbands on. The bands made me think of ankle tags used to monitor offenders out in the community who were on curfew. I was clueless to their purpose here. The food delivered, I pushed the trolley back into the control room, just as an alarm went off. The CO moved over to one of the monitors, frowned and said, They chose the wrong place to get lost. 
Over his shoulder, I could see a small boat had come across the rocks at the edge of the island, and two men were clamoring out. The vessel wasn't a military, and neither were they. The CO barked out an order. Get a team there now. And as the two men struggled ashore, another monitor in the control room showed three armed soldiers running out of the building and heading for them. Rifles were pointed and these soldiers shouted at them. There was no volume on the live feed, but I could see these soldiers' mouths and the confused and terrified reactions of the two men. They fell to the ground, helped on the way by the rifle butts being struck against their heads, and then they were dragged into the building. The CO turned away from the screen, a satisfied smile on his face. Such a shame, he said, that they were lost at sea and their bodies will never be recovered. The conspiracy theorists might claim otherwise, but who cares what they think? In the meantime, we've got ourselves a couple of new lab rats. Get them processed and in a cell. The other two soldiers in the control room began typing. I was left once more horrified at the cold brutality that I was witnessing. Feeling sickened, I took over monitoring duties from one of the soldiers who had finished his shift on guard duty in the control room. The CO laughed not long afterwards. All was quiet after this for a while, thankfully, and I was finding it hard to keep my eyes open when the CO returned. You there? He shouted. Eyes on cell six. One of the lab rats is about to be given a treatment. There's an armed response team on standby if required. I had so many questions that I dared not ask, but my most pressing concern was, which of the cells was number six? I looked along the screens, trying to work this out until I saw a scientist entering the cell block. Her long black hair was on a ponytail and she was carrying a syringe. She came to a halt in front of one of the cells. This had to have been cell six, I figured. Inside, a young man sat on his haunches, his back against the far wall, a blank expression on his face. Like the others, he had one of these strange wristbands on. The CO turned to the other soldier on duty and said, Induce a cardiac arrest. Without batting an eyelid, the soldier moved a dial. In the cell, the young man suddenly sat up straight and his face twisted into an expression of utter agony. Long seconds after the dial had been moved, the man's mouth opened in a scream that I could see but not hear, and then he went limp and lay unmoving. The soldier pronounced, Death has been achieved. The CO nodded and spoke into a microphone. You can enter the cage and administer the treatment. The scientist raised her hand to the camera and made an okay gesture. The cell door slid open at the touch of another button and she stepped inside. She leaned over the man on the floor and injected him in the neck then moved away until she was back outside of the cell. The door closed and I was left watching and wondering, what was the point of giving a dead man an injection? Moments later, the corpse began to twitch. Although there was a secure door between her and it, I noticed the scientist take a few steps back. And then the corpse's hands began to open and close. Its back arched and it sat slowly up. He wasn't dead. I said this out loud without meaning to. The CO looked at me and grinned. He was dead. Now he's something else. He is remade and he is now one of the living dead. I felt the room begin to spin around me. This was insane. I gripped the desk in front of me and stared at the screen, transfixed, horrified, as the thing in the cell rose to its feet. Its movements looked jerky and uncoordinated. Its eyes were glazed over and its mouth hung open. It placed its palms on the front of its cell and then sank slowly down to its knees and fell backwards. It did not move again. 
the forces which had animated it appeared to have slipped away. The CEO swore and slammed his fist against the monitor cracking it. On the screen, I could make out the fractured image of the scientist. Her face was streaked with tears as she turned and walked away. The CEO left the room soon afterwards and I looked from screen to screen. The routine of the facility carried on. It was business as usual on Nightmare Island. A while later, a new soldier came into the control room and told me to take a meal break. Following his directions, I caught the elevator back up three levels and walked out into the mess. The scientist who had given the injection was there. She was sitting at a corner table by herself. A plate of barely touched food sat on the table in front of her. I got myself a tray and a ladle full of stew and I wandered over to her. Mind if I join you? I asked. She shrugged her shoulders. Knock yourself out. I sat opposite of her and began to eat. I had no appetite but didn't want anyone who might see me on the monitor covering the mess to think anything out of the ordinary was going on. Like an honest conversation. Look, I said, keeping my attention apparently on my plate. I saw what happened to that prisoner and it sickened me. But I'm not holding you responsible. I assume like me you're just doing your job. She glanced up at me. I could see her eyes were still red from crying. How much do you know? She asked. Fragments, I replied. But nowhere near enough to make any sense of things. A quiet, bitter laugh escaped her lips. Sense, she echoed. This has got nothing to do with sense and everything to do with power and the tools governments and the military want to keep their authority. In this case, we're talking about zombies. I forced down another mouthful of stew as she continued. You see, the American authorities have had weaponized zombie assets for years. All totally hush-hush, of course. Though there are rumors swirling around in chat rooms on the deep web that a small number have escaped and are roaming the swamplands of the deep south, where, according to the post, they are not the strangest things there. On the other side of the coin, there are believed to be vast prisons in Siberia that are essentially zombie production lines. We are in the United Kingdom, unfortunately, and we've always lagged behind. Scientists second to the military have been trying to create zombies for decades, but there have been constant issues. According to the dressing down that I just got from my superior, it turns out all the current ones are my fault. She smiled as sadly as she said this. The thing in the cell, I asked. It was meant to be some kind of zombie soldier. She nodded before adding. But the chemicals that we're using can only animate the dead for a very short period of time. She looked genuinely disappointed about this and I began to have serious doubts about her. Surely any right-minded person would condemn the whole process of trying to make zombies. Oh, don't look at me like that, she said, interrupting my thoughts. I don't know what you mean, I lied, remembering why I never played poker. My expression far too often gave away exactly what I was thinking. She smiled again, a warmer smile. You seem like a genuinely good guy, so I will tell you the reason that I'm here and doing my best to succeed. My older sister is terminally ill and I believe the processes that we are developing here can help her survive. Not as a zombie, before you ask, but as a healthy woman with a future. Seems pretty extreme, I muttered. Once more, she shrugged her shoulders. Not if you take into account that her condition is inherited and as such, that I am on borrowed time. I understood then. I had signed up to get myself out of jail. She was trying to get out of a death sentence. I made myself smile and said, My name's Matt, by the way. Sarah, she replied. It's good to meet you, Matt. Now, you'll have to excuse me. I need to get back to trying to create living dead super soldiers for the powers that be. She winked and then bust your tray and laughed. I did the same and returned to the control room. 
I had another three hours left in my shaft, and then six hours to get some sleep in a claustrophobic bunk before I was back on duty. I didn't sleep a wink though, I couldn't stop thinking about Sarah. Part of it was the affinity that I felt for somebody caught up in the grotesque world of the facility. I also thought that she was beautiful and as crazy as it sounds, I knew that I had started to fall in love with her. My alarm went off at the crack of dawn the next day all the same. I washed and ate and drank five cups of coffee far too quickly and then reported for duty. My first job was to deliver the slops to the prisoners. Most of the cells were occupied and I recognized the two unfortunate men who had washed up in the island were among them. They had the wristbands on and looked like they had no idea where they were. I doubt if they even knew their names anymore. Cell 6 was empty. Presumably the body from yet another failed experiment to create a zombie soldier had been taken away and disposed of. The cold, brutal CO probably ordered it, weighted down and thrown into the sea. After I had finished taking round the slops, I returned to the control room and once again, I was ordered to watch the various monitors. There was nothing of note until late afternoon, when the CO came into the control room. Eyes on cell 8, he told myself and the other soldier on duty. I started to feel sick in anticipation of what I knew was about to happen next. Another grotesque experiment. And then I saw Sarah walk into view and despite everything, I felt a rush of happiness. I decided on the spot that I would see her again as soon as I could and tell her how I felt. As before, she held a syringe in one hand and once again, the life of the helpless prisoner was extinguished through some signal spent via the wristband and his death monitored through this same device. He lay unmoving on the floor as the cell door was opened and Sarah was told that she could join in. She administered the injection and then turned back to the open door so she could safely leave while the prisoner was still dead. And then the CO gave a new order. Close the door. The other soldier obeyed with the press of a button and the door slid shut trapping Sarah inside. I shot to my feet and couldn't stop myself from shouting out, What are you doing? A cruel smile spread across the CO's face as he said, She just became part of the experiment. I was helpless to do anything other than watch as the body of the prisoner began to twitch. As Sarah slapped her hand against the closed cell door and her eyes grew wide with fear, as the prisoner rose slowly to his feet, no longer a corpse but transformed into one of the living dead. It shuffled towards Sarah with its arms held stiffly out. She frantically tried to push it away but it was far too strong, and she opened her mouth in a scream as the thing bit the side of her face. Blood began to flow down her cheek. She staggered backwards and I thought the zombie was going to follow and attack again. But as before, its strength had deserted it and did topple to the ground. Sarah stood, pressed against the cell wall as far from it as she could get. She stared at the corpse that was once more still, and then turned to face the camera. I could see the terror that she felt, the confusion and the pain. If I had been armed, I would have killed the CO at that moment in time, but I wasn't and I could only watch as he left the control room. I had never felt more powerless in my life. In the cell, Sarah slid to the ground and hugged her knees to her chest. Looking at her, I knew I had to try and do something to help her, no matter what the consequences were for me. My chance came that same day. The other soldier on duty was not long back from the mess hall and all of a sudden he put his hands on his stomach. The filth they serve in that place shouldn't be allowed, he groaned. I, he began to say and then ran out of the room, leaving me alone. Acting on impulse, I punched the button to open the door of the cell where Sarah was confined and I raced through to the block. She was still sitting hunched up and rocking back and forwards. She did not have a wristband on. 
I guess one was not needed for this warped experiment. I didn't know how long I had before the other soldier returned from his discomfort break, or my absence from the control room was noticed by an officer, so I got straight to it. I went into the cell and put my hand on her arm. Sarah, I'm going to get you out of here, but we have to go now. She looked slowly up at me. Her skin was very pale and she was coated with sweat. No, she replied in a hoarse voice. You should leave me. Get yourself out and if you can, find my sister. Tell her that I did my best and that I love her. I grabbed both of her hands in mine and said, You can tell her yourself. Now hurry. And then I helped her to her feet. She was very unsteady and I half carried her out of the cell block through the control room and into the elevator, where I slammed my palm onto the button that would take us back to the surface of the island. My heart was pounding in my chest and Sarah was coughing badly. The odds of us making it out of there without being stopped by armed guards were mighty slim. I was more worried about the likelihood of Sarah surviving long enough for us to try. But somehow, we found ourselves stumbling out onto the bleak surface of the island. I looked around. It was going dark and I couldn't see far, but as best as I could tell we were alone and hideously exposed. With a jolt of excitement, I remembered the boat which had run aground. This way, I told Sarah. Her head was drooping forward and she looked on the verge of passing out. I swore under my breath, lifted her up off the ground and ran for where I hoped the boat would still be. My heart soared when I saw it perched unevenly on the rocks. I held Sarah inside, and then moved around to the back of the boat and pushed and lifted and strained using every sinew of my body to try and move the thing clear enough off the rocks to refloat it. I had read somewhere once about the aftermath of accidents where mothers lifted cars off their children. And the article had said that in the most extreme of circumstances, an ordinary person can find extraordinary strength to save somebody that they love. On the island that day, I found the strength I needed to free the boat from the rocks. I jumped aboard and I started the engine. In the distance, a siren sounded. Our escape had been discovered. I gunned the engine to full speed and said a silent prayer. It was soon full night. The sky was overcast and the only sounds that I could hear were the waves crashing against the hull. I listened and waited for the sound of helicopter blades or a pursuing bow to join these seas, a restless serenade, but there was nothing. Daring to hope, I locked the boat's steering wheel in place and went to check on Sarah. She was curled up on the deck and I felt her forehead first. She was burning up. I took a deep breath and tried to sound calm and confident when I said, we're going to make it. As soon as we land, I'll phone for an ambulance and get you to a civilian hospital where the army won't be able to touch you. I didn't even know if she could hear me, but I kept talking. And when you're better, we'll go and find your sister together and you can tell her those three magic words. I leaned in closer and whispered, I love you. Sarah's eyes flickered and opened at these words and she looked up at me. I'm sorry she said, and then the life left her eyes. She was dead. I lowered her gently back down and rose slowly to my feet. I was devastated. I would find Sarah's sister and tell her how much Sarah had loved her, but I could not think further ahead than that. I began to make my way back to the steering wheel and was taking off the lock when I heard a groan. It was low and harsh and for a moment I thought that I had imagined it. And then the sound cut harshly through the night once again. It was coming from behind me where Sarah's body lay. A cold dread spread through me. Please, I thought. Please, no. I turned. Sarah was getting to her feet. Her movements were clumsy and slow. She lifted her head and looked in my direction. Her eyes were glazed and I knew in that moment that this was not the woman that I had loved. This was an aberration. It was one of the living dead. It began to shuffle towards me. 
Even if there had been anywhere to flee to on a small boat in the ocean, I couldn't have moved. Fear held me trapped in place as surely as the walls of any cell. The zombie came closer and closer. Its mouth opened and I could see drool falling from its lips. Its arms raised and its hands reached out. It wanted me. It wanted to sate its obscene appetite on my flesh. And within seconds it would be on me. I had to act or it would be too late. Finally, I managed to snap out of my terror-induced fugue. I couldn't get away by now. The only thing left to me was to lash out. I drove my fist into its face. The zombie staggered and momentarily I had it off balance. I did not stop and think. I threw myself at it and forced it towards the edge of the boat, where it toppled and fell into the dark water. I stood watching as it thrashed and howled and then, as quickly as the reanimated corpses that I had seen before, it grew still. Its arms fell back by its side and the body drifted away on the tide. The thing that Sarah had become was no more. That was hours ago. Dawn is breaking and I am shivering at the fever that holds me in its grip as I look down once more at the bite mark on my wrist. I wonder, will I know what is happening after I die and am reanimated into one of the living dead? Will I feel the rage burning inside me, a rage that flares and then is gone, leaving me a cold, empty corpse alone on a boat drifting in the ocean? I do not know. There is only one thing that I'm sure of. This is the last sunrise I will see.